Audio Content Lab. The hum of your refrigerator. The distant sound of a motorcycle or a train. The background noise of a TV in another room. We live in a world of sound, and our minds basically never stop analyzing the audio we perceive, even when we're asleep. That's because our brains are meaning-making machines, not just because we can do it, because we have to. Our sound minds never turn off, because parsing the world through audio cues has been a part of survival for millennia. Today we're talking to Dr. Nina Krauss about her book, Of Sound Mind, and learning how brains process audio, discovering how we can better understand this primal function, and exploring ways marketers can be a part of their audience's sonic world. Let's get to it. Sounds like marketing. Welcome to Sounds Like Marketing, the audio content marketing podcast that's here to dial businesses and brands into the importance of sound. I'm Jake Sanders. I'm joined by Paul Julius. Paul, how are you, sir? Quite well, thank you. I'm excited about this episode. Uh, uh, I am double, triple excited about this uh, because it's it has so many magical moments. This conversation with Dr. Nina Krauss, who is just a longtime researcher into sound, how our minds process it, how it's a part of our world. And then she gracefully, graciously uh, dips into the advertising and sonic branding bag. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's brilliant. But you have a fantastic article that is a perfect hot take to start this one. So why don't you introduce it? Yeah, this was fun. So this is from Mashable.com. Uh, it's called Why Notification Sounds Send You Emotionally Reeling Into the Past. And then the subtitle is Our Brains Are Hiding Sonic Secrets. Um, <laughs> I love this. So this is, a, this is a great article. And they talk to uh, Facebook sound designer. And it says, wow. you know, uh, Will Littlejohn. And he says, the sounds that we have are adding to a tapestry. And mm. they're adding on and they're talking about sound design and all these different um message notifications, even going back to like AOL or hmm. AIM, um, oh, yeah. stuff like that. But, you know, the, the article about this is kind of starts off about how um, she was dating someone and they met um, and they originally were exchanging messages over Facebook Messenger. And so mm -hmm. the sound of the Facebook Messenger notification um, kind of became ingrained to this mm. author. Mm. And so she digs it a little bit deeper. Um, but the, the quote that I really like out of this um, is they, they say that the sound itself can't force a feeling. It has to be the context that the sound is in. Mm. And additionally, UI sounds themselves may be new and specifically prime for association, but the phenomena is just an extension of how our brains already process sound, whether created by the wind and trees or by a buzz in our pocket. So mm -hmm. I think to me, like, and Dr. Krauss brings it out way better um, yeah. about, you know, context and stuff like that. But my hot take out of this mm -hmm. is, and I'm going to try and be brief because, because the interview is long, it's worth it, but I don't want, I want people to get to that. Um, yep. Dr. Krauss talks about alert sounds that when, that we're constantly um, processing sound whether we we know it or not and, right. and she uses an example of like an air conditioner running or a loud refrigerator and you don't really notice it till it goes off but that's our bodies like you know long time that's your ADT you know that's your your body's alarm right is how do we notice things that are going on because there's so much information processing yeah um and so I started thinking about like well what what gets our attention? Like how do, what triggers those alert things? And I put them into three kind of basic things. A new sound starts, an existing sound stops, or a sound that's been going on changes in character, right? 
So like a pitch goes up, something starts happening a little faster, a little slower. Mm -hmm. And I guess my take out of this um, from the article and from the interview and all of it is one thing that Dr. Krause says is, is being more intentional about using sound and maybe thinking about using less. Could we use some of these different things to be more intentional in advertising? And could we use these alerts, maybe not necessarily to alarm someone, but to draw attention to or heighten awareness to something by using these kind of built in sonic biological cues. Yeah. I mean, I it just, it made me think of um, Hans Zimmer has this technique when he's doing scores and it's, it's like, it feels like things are infinitely rising, but mm, he has, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, I forget what it's called. There's like a technical term for it, but Something's going up and something's going down, but they're both going up and down forever. Mm -hmm. And so it just grabs your, uh, you know, it just creates this tension. You know, I'm thinking of the dark night, you know, when um, he's using that like electronic cello, like there's just a, like a really gritting kind of thing. And it, it just really amps you up. Any of Johnny Greenwood's soundtracks too. I mean, like there will be blood, like there will be anxiety is what that should be called. Because I remember watching that movie and just feeling like, wow, man, I'm really on the edge of my seat here. And it's something that, uh, you know, you mentioned is, is that your brain's paying attention to it even uh, unconsciously, you know? Mm -hmm. So like your create, your, your brain is thirsty for context. Um, it wants to make sense of what's happening. And I, I think that's one of the things that my hot take about this article is that so much of marketing lives in isolation from audiences. It's like we, we build entire campaigns and strategies disconnected from audiences. We're in our boardrooms, we're in our team slacks or whatever, you know, brands are testing their products in a lab environment, in a focus group, you know, but mm -hmm. they're never really considering how it's going to be experienced by consumers. Which, you know, if it's an ad campaign, you know, they're just swiping right on things. Or if they're watching TV, they're not necessarily paying attention. But their brain is. And so music is this way to really get in. But what, what, what I think is, is really key is, and what Nina uh, hits just eloquently on is that you have to understand your audience's context. You know, and you have to appreciate that they have all those notifications. They have appliances making noises. They have, you know, sounds surrounding them. They have a general level of anxiety that you yeah. have to compete with and also mm -hmm. participate in. And so that's why it's, it, it's, it's kind of inspiring to find a way that marketers can respectfully connect and communicate with an audience. And, you know, may, may, maybe that's through frequency, you know, like, um, you know, you, you head on, apply directly to forehead, head on, apply directly to forehead, you know, mm -hmm. or they say that number over and over and over, 1-800-345-555, 1-800-345, and then they, you know, you keep hammering it into people, but is there a more nuanced way? Like the, that third uh, thing that you mentioned about getting attention is sounds changing, mm -hmm. um, a, a change in the character. And I think maybe there's something marketers could do when they're approaching sonic branding and even just general communications is silence, you know, or something that is unique, something that's distinct, adding textures and, and, and being more playful with the way we communicate. I, I think there's something there that this article hints on that the interview hints on you're you're competing with a busy busy brain and so your job is to do something that is unique distinct but also respectful and kind of honors the audience and and sees them in their moment and reaches them in their context and i just think that's that's what that's what my thought is yeah and it's I, I and i think they kind of go together too because really it says even in the article you know in the brain a sound is never just the raw data of a sound wave there's always something more to it and we associate these sounds from the minute it goes in 
I mean, our brains are constantly trying to catalog and like you said, context. I mean, that's really what a lot of like just survival is about. Like, right. You know, where is this sound coming from? Am I outside in a field? Am I inside, you know, in my safe house? Like it, it all matters. And and I think Nino really, really um, hammers that home. You got to listen to the whole thing to get to the sound quiz at the end um, where she <laughs> really kind of kind of lays us out in a very uh eloquent and friendly way but um really gives a whole different idea and meaning to 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 context and and how sound and your brain kind of work together on these things and she she's the expert i mean she yeah. has spent decades studying this um from all the different ways uh you know neurobiology you know just regular biology you know, audiology, uh, you know, the, all those things. There's Pavlovian stuff. That's a bit of psychology there. You know, um, there's so many different angles and Dr. Nina Krauss just tears into it. And it, it's an honor that we got to share this moment with her. So it's a fascinating interview. Let's get to it. Let's go. Dr. Nina Kraus is a neuroscientist who has done pathbreaking research on sound and hearing for more than 30 years. Dr. Kraus is the Hugh Knowles Professor of Neurobiology, Communication Scientist, and Otolaryngology at Northwestern University. In her new book, Of Sound Mind, Dr. Kraus examines the partnership of sound and brain, showing for the first time how the processing of sound drives many of the brain's core functions. And she's here today on the podcast to talk about it all. Dr. Kraus, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so give us a bio of your work in sound. I, I know it's a, a long, distinguished career. Uh, where, where did this fascination come from, and when did you decide to pursue your current path? Well, it, it kind of came together. You know, it wasn't that I had any vision about it ahead of time, but I grew up in a house where more than one language was spoken. My first language is Italian, and my mom was a pianist. So there was a lot of music around, there was a lot of singing. One of the other languages I speak is harmony. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I used to, you know, take my little things I was working on and bring them underneath the piano and just hang out there while my mom was playing because, you know, sound, it just felt great to be around it. Right. Yeah. And uh, then I, you know, eventually when I went to college, um, I, I majored in comparative literature because I knew some languages I like to read. And then uh, that was cool until I, I took a, a biology class for a distribution requirement. And I thought, oh man, this is very cool. And I like signals and um, you know, the biology is, is, is pretty amazing, I think, um, to, to, to think about. And, um, and then I, I discovered a book that was called the biological basis of language. And I thought, oh, well, that's cool. So, you know, I could sort of think about, and, and you know, I, I never really fit into a particular field. I never mm -hmm. did, never will. I mean, mm -hmm. just even I grew up in two countries and I don't feel like I belong to either one, but I feel like I belong at the intersection. So, yeah. you know, my, my work really draws from, uh, you know, from physics, from philosophy, from, um, you know, all over the places. Um, but anyway, so I, I, I started um, wondering about sound processing in the brain. And for my dissertation, I was recording from single neurons in the auditory cortex of, um, of a bunny rabbit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you play a sound and um, that neuron responds to sound, it will, uh, you know, it will show you because of the electrical response, the currency of the nervous system is electricity. And so you see that response. And then if you teach the bunny that the sound has some kind of meaning, you know, like a carrot's gonna come, um, when that comes and they, they hears the sound, um, then it's the same bunny, it's the same sound, it's the same neuron, but the response is different. And, and so, you know, I could see firsthand how our experience with sound changes how our brain 
deals with it. So, so that was, you know, that was, that was a big deal. And then yeah. of course, you know, we, we still have animal models that inform our human work, but we're mostly interested and we mostly do work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how, how people and people's experiences influence sound processing in the brain. Yeah. Yeah. And um, all of that is very uh, expertly condensed in your your new book of Sound Mind, which is brilliant. I just finished it like we were saying before we hit record. I, I suggest everybody go give it um, uh, their attention because you sort of have these, you know, your work with brain volts and, and working with um, humans and all these different environments. You've really discovered some amazing things and it isn't just a in and out thing there there's it's kind of everything happening at once i mean is it possible for you to just give us a pitch you know briefly for your book and then yeah. can you highlight some of the uh research and the findings that most excited you yeah so um you know the book is my love letter to sound and it's written conversationally so it's, it's, you know, this, this is my crusade to encourage people to think more about sound because, you know, as a culture, as a society, we don't think about sound that much because it's invisible and we live in a very visually biased world and yet it is a profound force in our lives. And so I'm, I'm a, a biologist and I talk about what we know, biologically speaking, about what sound does to us and how our brain is changed by the choices we make by our life in sound. So if you're a recording engineer or, uh, you know, you live in a noisy place or right. you speak a couple languages or you are a, um, an athlete. All of these things influence sound processing in the brain. And I, I wrote this book, as I say, conversationally written, mm -hmm. but it is, you know, the, the editor at MIT was surprised when I turned it in. A huge you know, section of it is references. So it's, it's it, you know, it's reference with the best science I know, but it is, you know, put together in, in a way that doesn't presume any biological knowledge other than what I'm going to be presenting right. uh, for, for the reader. A big point of the book is that the hearing brain is vast. Mm. People think about hearing as, oh, you know, the ear, but it's really mostly what your brain makes of it. Mm -hmm. And so hearing engages you know, the, the, the fancy way, the formal way of saying it is our cognitive, sensory, motor, and reward systems. Well, let's break that down. So cognitive is what we pay attention to, what we remember, what we know, cognitive. Sensory is how we combine information from all our senses. Motor is move, movement, and, you know, just to produce sound, sound is movement. All of the networks of the brain that are involved in those many, many, many activities. So, you know, it, the hearing brain is vast. It is enormous. And uh, one of the things that I, I learned early on was, you know, so if, if you had to think about what it is that we do at Brain Vaults, um, and, and um, you, you know, you might think of how, how is it that we learn biologically through sound? And I discovered that, you know, music is the jackpot for the vast hearing brain and for learning through sound. Because if you think about music, it really engages our cognitive, what we know, sensory, our interaction with other senses, motor, how we move, and how we feel networks and music does that better than any other sound so it's a great model as well as just a wonderful wonderful being that we can interact with on this planet yeah um you know we have we have this music which is um so i, I talk a lot in the book about about music 
But I also, you know, if, if you go to the home page of our website, which I also encourage your listeners to do, you will see that, that, that we study all kinds of things. We study athletes and concussion and music and rhythm and aging, language, language disorders like autism. Um, you know, we, we study all these things. And, and you might think, well, you know, what, what are they even doing at Brain Wolves? <laughs> but it is all under the umbrella of sound and the brain. Sound brain is vast and it engages and it influences everything that we care about, which, you know, like child development, education, medicine. It really does. As, as you, you know, who I mean, if you're in, into marketing, you know, there are many, many audiences that you interact with. Right. Which is why, you know, I, I think so. So the book is, is, is my crusade to have all in one place some ideas that I think are important for people to think about so that in the end, knowing what the brain does with sound and how our life in sound matters, because the things that we spend a lot of time doing really change our brain. So, so we have to make good choices. And I think if people, you know, I mean, uh, knowledge is empowering. I think if people understand how important these choices are and what it really does to our brain, if we make music and if we don't, for example, um, this will, I think, influence how we raise our kids, what we think about in terms of education, what we think about in terms of 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 the the noisy world we live in. I mean, there are so many choices that we can make every day um, that I hope the biological knowledge of what our life and sound does to us will really help. Yeah. Well, and so one one of the things that I thought was interesting is you talk about the role of music and language acquisition. Um, and sort of the overlapping themes that are there. But um, I thought it was most interesting when you sort of uh, popped a hole in the Mozart effect, because a lot of parents are thinking, well, I'll just throw some Mozart at them, and then they'll, they'll just pick it up. Um, do you want to kind of rap about that, um, sort of that misnomer? Or it, it, it's important to have music and in the house and stuff, but how, how does the Mozart effect work? How, how do we get that wrong? Yeah. Well, I mean, when you listen to Mozart, when you listen to anything that you like, you, you listen to the sound of somebody you love's voice that puts you in a better mood. And that's, you know, kind of what the Mozart effect is all about. And if you're in a better mood, you might do a little better on a test. Um, but it's very short term. It doesn't fundamentally change your brain in any way. Moreover, what is really important is that you actually make music. So you have to make these sound to meaning connections. And, and you know, being a sound engineer counts. You know, singing counts. Being a, a bird watcher, it's really, you know, you're listening. You're a bird listener. Um, you're making sound to meaning connections that are really detailed. You do it for year after year after year after year. You're making the sounds. And that will fundamentally change your default pathways, the way even when you're asleep, your brain will respond. You know, for example, if I were to put sensors on your head while you were asleep, you, you know, you'd be sound asleep. But if I say the, if I say your name, your brain will just automatically register that because, you know, you've learned, this is your default system. You've learned that this is a sound that is worth paying attention to. Right. The other thing is, you know, people say, well, what about if I only listen to sound? Listening is great, but, you know, I, I use the analogy of you're not going to get physically fit watching sports. <laughs> There's probably a lot of people in the audience that are feeling like, I feel fit when I watch football, but as I eat these nachos, maybe not so much. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, it, it, it's really important to think about Again, the choices that we make in our daily lives and the way we engage with the world and, and sound. Oh, I mean, just even now, you know, one of my heroes, Ian McGilchrist, coined uh, the, the word betweenness. And he uses it as a way to um, 
talk about all kinds of, of interactions between living things. But I think sound embodies between us better than anything. Because, I mean, look at us right now. We're kind of going back and forth. We don't have a script. We're improvising. We're everyday improvisers. Yep. Um, and we're in the moment. You know, we haven't like prepared some kind of uh, text that we're going to put on Instagram. And we haven't, you know, just we are right here. And it is between we're going back and forth and back and forth. And, and think about think about what it's like if you s sing harmony with somebody. Mm. If you're singing harmony with somebody, you're listening and you're changing your motor production and then you're listening, they're listening and you're just going this back and forth, this constant between this, this interaction or how babies learn to talk, you know, first they make sounds and you, they go, ah, and you say, ah, and then they go, ah, and you say, ah, and it's just this back and forth. It's between us. It's in the moment and sound Sound is so, so, so powerful, so under-recognized as a powerful force in our lives and something that we need to make really good choices about, which is where you guys fit in. Um, because, you know, you, you do, you're in a position to um, direct people's choices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that we know biologically is that everyone is different. So that if I take the biological response to, I don't know, a hard day's night, and, and we hear how your brain processes it versus mine, it'll be recognizable as a hard day's night in both cases. But, you know, we're into signals. If you actually look at the signals that make up not only the sound waves, but the brain waves, pitch and timing, tam timbre, phase, you know, we were talking about compression. I mean, all yeah. of these things influence, these are all ingredients in sound that your brain needs to make sense of. And we all, based on our life and sound, and then I use, and you, you know, you like this as, you know, I, I use in, in the book, the metaphor of a mixing board. Yes. You know, the brain is a mixing board. So sound has all these ingredients. It you know, goes into our brain. And if you think of a mixing board with the faders going up and down, you can see that each one of our life and sound, um, each one of our brains, um, you know, we can see how good a job my brain is doing or your brain is doing processing these different ingredients. So we can see, well, these are some strengths. These are some bottlenecks, maybe in a kid who has a reading disorder. You know, th these are all things that we can, we have, we can get information from. And so we have done a lot of science and we've learned a ton, um, as have other labs. And so, you know, I, I, we don't work in isolation, you know, and, and as you'll see, you know, in the book, I mean, there are references from all over the place. And that's what, you know, you, you learn what, what I think is the converging biological evidence for, you know, whatever it is that we think and, and what yeah. I wrote about. Yeah. I mean, you really nailed it. One thing that Jake and I talk about a lot, and it was really great to hear you say it too, is that we are such a visually focused world, especially when it comes to like advertising and ads, everyone's talking about, you know, what did it look like, uh, building all these different boards, but something, you know, that Jake and I have hit on before, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your take on it is, you know, a lot of it seems like in kind of sonic construction in advertising or marketing or whatever is the, the, the easy thing is just repetition, just do it over and over again, you know, or make a catchy jingle or something. And, and, you know, we're always kind of looking for something deeper. And I think, I think you're the right person to ask about that. Like, what did you, have you found anything that you think might be helpful or at least something that, that advertisers and marketers should consider um, yes. when it comes to that kind of construction? I think that's such a good question. Um, and, and I think coming at it from a biological perspective, the sound to meaning connections we make are really important. And, you know, people always want a formula because, you know, they, 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 they think that um, <laughs> they think so sim simplistically. Um, there's no formula. Um, you know, like people want to know what is the best instrument? Um, you know, what's the dosage? Uh, how many how many minutes do I do I play it? Uh, it, it? There's nothing like that. 
um, we're all different. And, um, and what it makes um, us beautiful, I think, and makes the biology beautiful is that we are all biologically different. So I think what you should keep in mind is be flexible. And, you know, I, I, I think that's really against what uh, marketing is after, because marketing is after, well, what's, what, what will give you the most likes, the most hits, yeah. so that we will make, you know, the big, the larger profit. Um, but in fact, if you are driven by something that is more nuanced, which is what is good for the society, what is good for people, what is good for people's health is you know, to use your, your judgment, not to give people too many choices that, that they can't make any sense out of, but, you know, use your knowledge to create a palette that allows tons of and respects, honors individual nuance. And, you know, ultimately that will also be the most successful because people are, they're, you know, for the most part, we're pretty sophisticated. Yeah, and you know, you know, pigeonholing works for computers, but we are our brain works nothing like a computer, and um, we need to be able to, you know, make good sound to meaning connections, and your branding will help us do that. But you know, help us then get to a place that is healthy. That is healthy for the brain and that isn't just um you know what's going to sell the most widgets <laughs> well and and so you you're bringing up something interesting too which you explain in your book is like we're just inundated by sound sound on in instagram sound on uh, you like everything is just autoplay and and you know a, a, a lot of people are just it's just noise you know and if you can get that palette right with a sonic branding, you can become a part of people's worlds. But but one of the things I was interested in is is you were saying sounds are coming from everything. Like my washing machine is making noise at me. My my car is making noise at me. Is is there a way? How how can you draw that line of mm -hmm. respect? I mean, is, is it using a, a, a cloth mallet marimba rather than a hard mallet, or is there some kind of way that maybe we could extract some of that thing to to get to a more healthier uh, sonic branding conception? Or mm -hmm. does that make sense? Well, I think keeping in mind what you just said is really important, which is that. Um, we have a lot of sonic distractions. So two of the things that people complain about, myself included, is, you know, we feel a little overwhelmed, a little stressed. You know, why is that? I think partly because sound is our alarm sense. It's always on. And, every, you know, every time somebody unlocks their car door, you know, you, you, know, you, you get alarmed because right. biologically, you know, eons of evolution have made sound our alarm sense. Moreover, the other thing that we often talk about is it's so hard to focus. It's so hard to, you know, just kind of keep one idea going. Well, of course, because you're constantly being interrupted. You're continent and you can't help, but every time there is a sound, a notification, an alarm, um, we get alarmed awake in the morning unless we choose not to. Um, so, you know, there are, uh, there, there are a lot of choices that we can make. And, but again, the first step, step one is realizing it. So for example, if, um, if there's a truck sitting outside my window now, say, I'm not even going to notice that it's there. The truck is on. When the driver cuts the ignition, Suddenly, what I do notice is I go, huh. you know, like when your refrigerator cycles off or the um, AC, air conditioners yeah, is, right. cycles off. Yeah. And again, you know, we don't realize that we are in this constant um, sense of, 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 of we're in a state. Uh, and, and, and there are 
things. There are choices we can do. You know, turn off the the, the notifications on your phone, on your um a washing machine on you. Nobody, your neighbor doesn't need to know when you're opening and closing your car door. Um, you know, I mean, be kind too. Um, you know, think about, about other people, uh, you right. know, in, in, in an airport, that's one of my biggest examples is airports inherently are noisy places, but we don't need to add to it. You know, mm. I mean, silence your phone, you know, you're on, you're on your phone all the time anyway, just, you know, it, it, it's just one more click. Um, and, and, you know, think, think about the people around you. You've got a kid who's playing some kind of a noisy game. We don't all have to hear that. Um, and, and airports inherently are noisy places. Conveyor belts are noisy. Engines are noisy. But we don't need, and again, this is where the branding comes in. We don't need to have this constant barrage of CNN, of every time a boarding pass is scanned or in a grocery store, beep, 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 beep. I mean, that's just, I mean, the poor people whose job it is to stand there, but still everybody at gate 25, you know, is hearing the 300 beeps for every passenger. You know, that's just not necessary. So I think it's important for us to ask ourselves and for you, you know, to, yeah. to be selective while at the right. same time being flexible to mm. really think about um, you know, what sounds are necessary. Um, and, and also giving people a choice about them. Um, I, 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 I think, I think that, that sonic branding is definitely something that works because our brain is really good at making sound to meaning connections. Oh, that those are mommy's footsteps coming up the stairs. I recognize those, you know, we were really good at that. But, you know, you have to treat that with respect. Branding works. So we know that that works biologically. How do we deal with it responsibly? It's, it's, an, it's an amazing question. And it, it sort of sparked another uh, insight that you cover in the book is white noise. Um, a lot of people like to use white noise um, to go to bed or to focus or, you know, those kind of things. But you mentioned something, and I, I think I, I think I got it right, was that it sort of prevents your ability to parse signal and noise uh, more. So it, it actually kind of adds to chaos. Did I get that right? Or is it, you it like sure did. You really yeah. did. Um, and, and the problem there is is white noise. So you know, I keep saying right. sound to meaning. Well, you know, babies in particular, and we're all prime to make sound to meaning connections, but we can't believe how quickly our babies are making these connections, right? Wow. Um, and now if you give them a sound that has no meaning, like white noise, there's no nuance, there's no meaning, there's no nothing. Um, the brain, even when it's asleep, is searching for connections. It's searching for meaning. And when wow. it doesn't find it, and we know this from, this is where good animal research comes in mm. because people have been able to, you know, it's very hard to, 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 to um, uh, control the sonic environment of a baby. But with a mouse, for example, you can control the sonic environment and, and, and um, you know, kittens even who, who have been exposed to moderate level, you know, white noise machines. Um, the, 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 um, the beautiful fine tuning of organization that happens biologically in the brain. So our brain is organized in many places as many pianos, you know, so we have, you know, tuning that goes from low to high, um, we call it tonotopic organization. And this is something that you can measure neurally. And we can see in these animals that um, this tuning, you know, so I, I, I you think of an image of, of a beautiful piano with a normal right. tuning and then think of an image. You've seen pianos where, you know, the keys are all really messed up and, the, you know, the ivory is off and, um, you know, some of the keys aren't working. So you've disrupted that. And that, mm. I mean, this really happens. So on the other hand, um, for babies, I really, I mean, again, this is my opinion. 
you know, I recognize, I, I would um, recommend, um, you know, learning to soothe yourself, find your thumb um, and, um, I, I think that, that there are other situations where, especially as adults, and when we have trouble sleeping, for example, in, in a noisy environment, um, you know, we, we can choose a different kind of sound. I mean, even, you know, birds and, and waves um, crashing, you know, I mean, waves, every wave is different. Uh, you know, this this is a rich, you know, like think about, uh, you, you can create a rich sonic environment. Um, and, and, and so, you know, having sounds like that, just be, knowing that this is how your brain works, knowing that it's your responsibility to make the best decisions for your kid, for yourself, I think can, can help change. You know, these are all things we can fix. We can all, these are all things that we can do, which is, I think, really, really hopeful. So, you know, my hope is that having some biological knowledge of you know what your choices really do to your brain um will help us because it helps me you know think about how i want to spend my life in sound right right oh jeez <laughs> okay <laughs> come on well and i feel bad because i feel like well i just want to cram sound into every like corner you know and uh, i want to you know i want to work with brands and i want to get them you know but you you make such an amazing point is nuance yeah. respect like you you do these things i want you to have your jingles and all those things and i'm pretty sure i'm woken up in the middle of the night by a jg wentworth you know it cars for kids Oh my God. Don't get me started with the cars Sorry. for kids. Sorry. Um, but it, it's really interesting how just with a little bit of nuance and respect, you can use those same things, at, but, but maybe even make a deeper impact. You know, one that, that spreads across demographics and just kind of hits the sound mind. You know, I just, I'm just, I yeah. love, I love that this. answer actually left, left, did leave me speechless. <laughs> so I'm like, but that was remarkable. Um, but so to get to it, one piece of advice for sound processing, music, audio, you know, most of the people who listen to this are involved in some way in, in creating it. And I think, you know, everything you just said is honestly really great advice. Yeah. <laughs> but you, if, it, if you had one like sound bite thing that you could say, all right, if you're going to lean on something, lean on this, what would it be? I think, well, I can, can, can I, I want to back up for a minute because it's um, all yours. you, you know, you, you want to know like, what is the best sound? There is no best sound. It's going to be different for everybody. But, um, you know, when people ask me, and, and you know, and again, it's, it's our computer focused, um, you know, they, they want you to check what genre of music do you like? Do you, you know, do you right. prefer jazz? Do you prefer rock? Do you prefer metal? Right. And, you know, when you ask me that question, it's like, I, I, I like good music. And, and, and I don't see boundaries, frankly. Um, and, you know, when somebody asks me, um, okay, I want to take you to dinner. Where do you want to go? Should we do Mexican, uh, French, Italian? And I'm saying, I don't care. I want good food. You know, I want good food. Yeah. So if I have a message, it is to really think about it. And it constantly changes what you decide today is going to be different for what you decide tomorrow or for this environment or that environment. Um, you know, be flexible and try to spend your life engaging with really good sounds like language and music. Try to avoid notifications, alarms, low level noise that is not necessary. Right. So you know, go for the good sounds and keep away from, from, from the bad sounds. Um, so there you go. And I love even, that. Even recognize that there's, that these things are happening. Cause I think a lot of people just don't, it's just background. Yes. You know? and, and you don't and even realize that that's affecting you probably pretty negatively. Huge. That's exactly yeah. right. And that's why I wrote the book because 
I found that no matter who I sat next to at the dinner party or whatever, um, when, you know, I started talking about, you know, what it is that I think about and with sound, it's like people um, are, they're interested and, and, you know, and, 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 and they didn't know. And, um, which, you know, so I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll write this book. And, and, and then I wrote this book and, and I sent it off to the publisher. And, and, and when I sent it off, I thought, why did I even write this book? This is all so obvious. And, and, and then, you know, what has been happening is I get correspondence from people from all walks of life, all over the world, yeah. um, who say exactly what you said, um, Paul, is um, I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that, that I think Jake and I can speak, at least from being on the marketing side. There's a ton of stuff like that. People don't even realize it's going on. <laughs> it's yep. happening all the time. And it seems like common sense, but yep. it isn't. You know, yes, co if, yes. if common sense was so common, it wouldn't be called that, I guess. Exactly. Um, but I, I have a question for you, Nina. Um, growing up, you know, in in, in different places, different countries, um, do you? Uh, did you find yourself like with a jingle that's stuck in your head? Do you have an earworm inside there that's like working you or, you know, is there one that you were fond of or, you know, maybe a jingle that you didn't like or, you know. Nah, nah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and again, it, it, it kind of changes. Like if, if I'm, you know, working on some a piece of music, you yeah. know, like I'll be hearing that, you know those bars again and again yeah um um yeah sometimes you get some uh, some annoying tune um <laughs> when it comes to mind is uh sugar sugar honey honey remember that song oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> i found myself you know just kind of at the zip copy machine and this thing is going through my mind and i'm thinking what am i even thinking about i uh, the, the 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 two that go through my head is the tonight show theme from johnny carson and then the theme song to patty duke like always forever all day it's just like popping up and i'm like cause they're cousins identical and i'm like i'm just swinging in my head and yeah, it's like well, you know I, and if you like it great and 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 if you want to distract yourself work on on um diminished chords i don't know you know like 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 get get your brain thinking about about sound in 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 a good way you know again because 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 we, we we need you know we all have these tendencies to do this and that right some of right. which are more positive than others but if, if yeah. you, you know can really take responsibility i think that's a big thing you know we all kind of need to take responsibility for um our life and sound yeah. well and uh, and speaking from through the musician standpoint i i remember being in a band and um we were kind of sloughing off our responsibilities we were kind of like well the the audience won't know and like and we're working won't. at well, or will Often. they, uh, you know, like, I, I kind of wonder, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to some symphony stuff and I'm like, Ooh, that cello's out of tune, yeah, well, you know, just, and yeah. ain't, ain't nobody else thinking about that, but on a, on a subconscious Pavlovian level, people do have that familiarity with music. I mean, it, it does your findings like back yes. that up or. Yep. Yep. And, and I think that kind of gets to, you know, there's also this idea of gut feelings. Mm. You know, I think a lot of what we do is not conscious, mm -hmm. but is based on our experience. So, um, you know, you, when you listen to some music, are going to probably be more discerning about some of the things and you'll be able to hear certain. I mean, I, I, my, my husband's a musician. And, you know, he can hear all kinds of stuff that I, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, he knows exactly how, you know, whatever it is we're listening to was mic'd and recorded and um, I, 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 and, and, and it's, it, it, it's great. And, and you're right. I think a lot of people don't, um, you know, again, if, if you're just looking for the number of hits, um, a mediocre piece of music might get a lot of hits. But, you know, you're actually, though, striving to, you know, here you're in your band to do something that would be worth listening to 
And yeah. and a lot of times, just as you say, and, and we work this way biologically, and I know this is the, the case, is that like nobody looks at the bass player, right? <laughs> but if the bass player is off, it just you know it, it it's not so great yeah absolutely oh, no doubt. well I, and, and, and 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 you don't know that you know like i mean some some people might say oh yeah it was the bass player and and that's why it it was off but right. a, a lot of people will just kind of say eh, it just it, they, they, they Didn't you know connect yeah they weren't yeah. on Oh, I mean, that's something Jake and I say this a lot. And this is some of the advice that I give to, you know, younger musicians is you're not, you're not fighting people not liking you. You're fighting apathy. If they they won't care. They, it, it doesn't connect. And it's really fascinating to hear you say, because it's on a biological level. It's happening like without their control even. So that's fascinating. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's really true. You know, what we bring, uh, you know, our brain is, is, is an organ of prediction and we bring with it everything that we, all of our memories, conscious and unconscious, and we, 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 we bring to that at every moment. So we're kind of going back again to this idea of it's really important to be making that unconscious as well as the conscious brain rich with um, you know, with, with, with good, strong memories for nuance. Wow. And it's just so amazing. It touches on texture oh. and, you know, these, these kind of things, a richness of palette, like, like there's just so many amazing things. And, and, and sometimes you think it's pearls before swine, you know, these people like, uh, Britney Spears or, you know, y'all like that pop music, but this is real music, you know, and I was in conservatory so we were we had our heads firmly up our butts. Um but you're you're bringing up a really great point that like those textures, the nuances, respect, um giving people good sound, good music, quality uh stuff. I I just think you you can't overstress the importance of that. Even if even if even if you think oh they don't care and even if you only get a couple likes, you know, you still got to say hey you know, I, I, I got my sound out there and I did something that respects intelligence. You know, I think a lot of people don't respect the intelligence inherent inside the audience. That's why they <laughs> just throw those things at us, those sounds, those beeps, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Respect the audience, respect the reader. You know, I, I was, you know, thinking about that, um, writing the book, you know, as I wrote of sound mind, um, you know, and I had, you know, my, my colleagues at Brain Bolts in particular, you know, reading um, along and and often I'd say, well, this seems like it might be a little too detailed. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 you know, they would often say, you know, respect your reader. Yeah. And, you know, if they want to skip over that, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But I, one, one of the things that I loved about your book was all the references. I was like, this, uh, this 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 author is not just coming up with some stuff yeah, in I'm a lab. <laughs> I was like, whoa, deep, deep. And I mean, that's a rabbit hole you could just fall into for years, all the references alone, you know? So my, my suggestion is please buy this book. Uh, go to Brain Volts. Check out the work uh, Dr. Nina Krauss is doing. And, and, and if you can take one thing away from this, respect that audience, make good sound. And and if people want to learn more or connect with you online, how can they do that? They can they can you can find my email. Mm -hmm. Yep, and she yeah. answered our email. So, folks, yeah. there is a hope. No, so I, 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 honestly, I uh, you know I, I throw it in a bin, and you know it might be months till I get to it. Um, but I, I I learn from what people tell me. Yeah. And, um, and if there's a way that I can help in a tiny, tiny way, uh, someone who's got a, 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 an issue that I might be able to address, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do that. You know, it, it's not, it's like no promises, not going to happen immediately, but, but do, you know, just do in fact, write to me and, yeah. um, and, you know, meanwhile, read my book, check out the website. Oh, and on the website, uh, one of the things we recently did is we have an icon that's a tour bus 
And I mm-hmm. encourage people to click that icon and you'll get a two minute tour of the website that'll help you find what you're looking for. And another thing about the website, but also about the book, and here's a point, which is that um, science is an art. And I worked together with a wonderful artist, Katie Shelley, who made the illustrations. There are 80 original illustrations in the book. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that you know, as, as you know, as you work with the sounds that you make, it's it's an art, and um, art is science, science is art, and, and it's, um, I think, just always important to, to honor. Time for a sound quiz. Are you ready? Yes. Uh, what is your favorite sound in the world? Depends. <laughs> wow. That's uh, a you, classic you, marketing answer, too, by the way. You hit us with the yep. science laser. Oh, if, if you had to pick one, so, somebody's like, Doc, tell us. What, what what do you think would be at the top of the list? No, and why would it be banjo? No, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> nah. I... Uh, I really, I really don't want to go there because it could be good banjo, and you know, banjo's like awesome. When I love it's banjo. Well. Yeah, people put banjo serious. in the world. Yeah. Well, then I, I, I feel like I might know the answer to the next question: is what's your least favorite sound? Yeah, meh. We can't. You know, I think probably one of my least favorite sounds, and that that one is easier, is meaningless noise, meaningless just sound. You know, like just. Um, engines rattling and and air conditioners and you know the noisy world world that we live in leaf blowers um you know just just uh sounds that uh we can probably either do without or attenuate absolutely nice. perfect right. answer and noisy appliances you know i mean you, you, they're just things that that people won't spend a little more money for a quieter refrigerator it's, and uh, i think if 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 they knew that the I, importance then you know people would market it i i i think i think you you're bringing up a really great deep marketing insight as a lot of people ha- have maybe uh vacuums or you know they sell you know other things and they have a chance to reduce the noise yeah. of those things but they skip on that they skimp on the budget and actually that could be one of the things that you use sonic branding wise that respects the audience. I, that's really, really important. And, and, and the, but the audience has to know because, you know, the audience will generally choose what's the cheaper option. But if right. they understand what having a noisy refrigerator does to sort of the stress level in your house, um, you know, maybe it's, it's worth the, it, it, I mean, it's definitely worth the, worth the price. Right. Yeah. It is. It's incredible. Way I mean, I cheaper even, than psychotherapy. I, I, I didn't even really think about it, but I mean, you're it's it's spot on the effect because I have a, a air conditioning for the first floor, and like that, when you turn it off, there definitely is like that. Oh, everything's kind of chill now. Like that's a yep. it's an amazing to just think about. Like that's an effect. Um, yeah. Okay. So speaking about effects, here's we're gonna do three sounds. So you ready? Here comes the first one. You want it potato again? chip. Yeah. No, it's eating a potato chip. Is it close? Could be. Could it is. But you know, again, the context matters. You can't just take things in, out of context. <laughs> context for everything, including <laughs> sonic branding, is going to be in the context you put it in. Dude, okay. And another right. great we're point. Getting school, we're getting. I know we're getting here, schooled Jake. by the doctor, Paul. <laughs> Come okay. on, man. Hold on, I'll play it oh, again. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be one of those little wind-up toys getting slowly getting unwound. Um, you know, again, sort of depends where 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 I where I hear it, right? 
the context a- it's in. Absolutely. So yeah. if if you were like on a river and you heard that, oh, it'd be a, a fishing rod. There you, you know? go. Yeah, there you go. exactly. Hey. But man, this is like I feel like I'm learning here right now. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, it, it's kind of what we know, right? I mean, I, we. we we bring all that with us, which is why we got to actually learn things. We can't just be looking up, like we used to like rack our brains for things for, and now we just ask Siri. Right. But then yeah. we don't have these things in our mind, like, you know, these memories that we can draw on subconsciously that help us make sense of things. Anyway. Oh, great. Point. All right. Last great one. I, I feel kind of bad about this one, but okay. Okay. Oh man, that's some kind of machine, and it could be like a leaf blower or, you know. So this was this was old school, and this is they called it, um, Polaroid, a Polaroid yeah, yeah, yeah. camera with the thing coming out. Yeah. But honestly, I think this entire sound quiz is a demonstration that without context, one sound could be six or seven, ten different things depending on who's listening to it and what the context is. Right, which is why for marketing and branding, you know, and, and people always like to, to they want to know well, what is the thing that's going to uh, work, and you know, it depends. It's that, that's absolutely I mean, yeah. You just proved it. I mean, geez. Sounds like marketing is a production of Audio Content Lab. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you find your podcasts, and follow Audio Content Lab for the latest in sound marketing advice. Until next time. Audio Content Lab.